All right, good afternoon. Um, we're going to start off with our guest uh, today, who we've uh, had the pleasure of having in the briefing before, and that is Rain Paulson, <coughs> the Food and Agriculture Organization's Director of Office of Emergencies and Resilience. Um, he is joining us from Kabul and to discuss the work that FAO is doing with farmers in Afghanistan. So please, you have the floor and then we'll, for opening comments, and then we'll take your questions. Stefan, thank you so much, and thank you, colleagues, for the opportunity to uh, brief uh, today. As Stefan mentioned, I'm uh, calling from uh, Kabul. Um, I arrived here on the first uh, UNHAS uh, flight uh, this weekend um, in support of the work that uh, FAO is doing countrywide to respond to uh, the desperately acute food uh, security situation. I wanted to do maybe a couple of things before coming to questions. First of all, um, share some reflections on um, the worsening situation, worsening humanitarian situation, but in particular some aspects that uh, are not as visible as they should be, uh, given their size, scope, and scale uh, when we look at the news and media coverage of Afghanistan at the moment. And then secondly, say a few things about the way in which FAO is responding currently at scale countrywide uh, to respond to uh, the situation. Um, but before I do that, just very quickly, I mentioned having flown in on uh, UNHAS, uh, incredibly welcome development that those humanitarian flights of the uh, uh, humanitarian air, air service are up uh, and running. Uh, deep gratitude, I know, from all the humanitarian community to WFP for the excellent work uh, they've done in putting that together and the donors that have supported them. Um, and also to say, since arriving here, I have been struck in the most compelling way by the dedication and commitment of the UN humanitarian staff, um, including FAO staff that are staying, delivering in an incredibly challenging, and as I think you all appreciate, uh, extremely dynamic, uh, dynamic environment. So some comments about what I've seen since I've arrived and what we as FAO have been uh, closely monitoring and assessing and evaluating uh, over uh, recent weeks uh, and months. The organization I represent, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, uh, is on the ground here in Afghanistan. Our focus is very much on shoring up uh, livelihoods and support to local food uh, production. And the reason why we're concentrating on this area uh, is because the importance of agriculture to the lives of rural uh, populations in Afghanistan simply cannot be uh, overstated. Agriculture is indispensable in keeping uh, the people of Afghanistan fed, keeping them alive, uh, and keeping them self-reliant. Uh, um, let me just give maybe three key data points in that regard. Millions of uh, rural Afghans depend on agriculture for food and, and income. Agriculture represents uh, more than a quarter, just over 25 percent of the GDP of the uh, of the country. It directly employs uh, some 45 percent of the workforce of the country, and perhaps most importantly, um, it provides livelihood benefits for fully 80 percent of the Afghan population. So, I mean, those numbers alone tell you just how indispensable agriculture is uh, in the context of Afghanistan, and why FAO is concentrating on this. So with those numbers in mind, um, comments that I wanted to share uh, now uh, with all of you uh, around this are to really underscore the extent to which many dimensions of the humanitarian crisis that's playing out in vast rural areas across the country really uh, in many ways is um, uh, invisible beyond the news headlines. And yet these rural areas are where seven out of 10 uh, Afghans live. Um, there is a drought underway at the moment, a severe drought that is impacting fully 7.3 million uh, Afghans. It's the second drought in four years, and we all understand how um, knock-on effects uh, take place when you have successive crises taking place and vulnerable populations do not have the chance to re-establish themselves before being struck by another crisis, which is the case of uh, the drought that's taking place now. These 7.3 million people affected by drought, as I mentioned, uh, are across the country, but we have severe drought effects in 25 out of the country's 34 provinces. So, I mean, that gives you a, a, a sense of the scale and the scope and the coverage of this. Of course, the COVID pandemic is also impacting um, 
uh, the vulnerable rural communities, as is, uh, goes without saying, conflict and insecurity that have further compounded this uh, situation. What this means in concrete terms is that there are 14 million Afghans who are what we classify as being in food crisis or emergency situations, IPC three and above. And I would stress that there's 4 million of those who are what we as in FAO classify as uh, in emergency status. Just to be clear what we mean when we say emergency status, uh, IPC phase four. This represents extreme gaps in food consumption, very high levels of acute malnutrition and excess mortality. I come from a country of 5 million people, and when I hear that there are 4 million people and see 4 million people in IPC4, it, the, the numbers really are difficult to uh, comprehend, but I hope you get a sense of scale. Displacement continues, more than 400,000 uh, IDPs uh, this year alone. Again, displacement mainly from rural areas, which I'll come back to uh, later, and those numbers are on the rise. And in addition to that, we have livestock, um, which, of course, vulnerable, live, uh, uh, vulnerable families are reliant on for their food security in many cases. Three million uh, life-sustaining livestock are at risk uh, as a result of the drought, inadequate pasture, inadequate food, and, and under threat. One of our deep concerns now as SAO, uh, FAO has to do with the time sensitivity. Um, we are looking at an unfolding situation uh, which is being compounded also now by challenges on the cash and banking system side, challenges to markets, uh, availability of agricultural uh, inputs, and all of this is threatening the most important cropping season in Afghanistan, uh, what's called the winter wheat season. This is uh, a season where farmers need to start planting now, this month, the end of, uh, the end of uh, September, uh, and it's critical to the, to the country. More than half of Afghans' daily calorific uh, intake comes from wheat. This crop is simply indispensable in food uh, security terms. Most of the wheat grown uh, in the country is sourced from uh, rain-fed uh, agriculture, the rain-fed winter uh, season. So the clock is very much ticking in this regard. I mentioned the end of September as being a key starting point for planting. Um, FAO in that regard has already mobilized significant support. We have resources in place to support an extra one and a quarter million uh, Afghans for this winter season, but much more is needed, uh, even though those are significant programs at, at large scale. The seeds can't wait, the farmers can't wait. This window uh, is uh, requiring an urgent scale up and uh, support from donors now. I wanted to say that FAO's package in responding to winter wheat um, is compelling in terms of the uh, investment that it represents and the transformational nature uh, that it represents. Our package of wheat and fertilizer and support costs $150. That's it. For $150, a family of seven Afghans will produce 1.2 million tons of wheat. I mean, these are a lot of numbers, but just to say they'll produce enough wheat uh, to give them cereal and flour for an entire 12-month period, $150 for 12 months' supply of wheat and flour. Incredibly impactful, very cost-effective, uh, and uh, again, underscores why it's imperative that we don't miss this winter wheat season. I wanted to come back to the displacement uh, issue as, as well. Uh, I mentioned a number before, 400,000 uh, Afghans displaced this year alone from rural uh, areas. The single most important factor uh, to uh, mitigating displacement as we look at this drought situation now is keeping farmers in their fields and keeping herders with their flocks. This is absolutely key to preventing a deepening displacement crisis. We know what will happen if agriculture collapses further. It will drive up malnutrition. Uh, it will uh, increase displacement, as I said, uh, and of course the overall humanitarian burden will uh, worsen. Uh, we've seen from experience in Afghanistan and elsewhere that when families are forced to displace, it takes on average between three and five years for this family to recover. It's imperative that we intervene in a timely fashion to avoid further displacement. The cost of assisting IDPs, of course, is much higher once people are displaced than if we can support them and prevent uh, displacement in the, uh, in the first instance. A few other quick words before I uh, describe some of the things that FAO is doing quickly and then we move to questions. I, I think I mentioned before livestock and just how 
vital as are. I've said some things about the winter wheat campaign and why that's indispensable. But Afghan herders and livestock owners also need uh, urgent assistance to counter the impact of drought during this winter season, during this uh, lean season that we're moving uh, into. FAO's assessments have shown that a high percentage of uh, herders, marginal herders and livestock owners are at a crucial stage. I've been speaking uh, this week with colleagues uh, literally from around the country who are talking about prices of livestock stock being depressed as a sign of farmers already dist uh, uh, distressed selling livestock as a coping mechanism. We need to make sure that that's uh, mitigated and prevented, and we need to uh, support these vulnerable herding and livestock families. With all of these needs in mind, uh, and these needs, of course, are part of the reason why we had uh, yesterday the uh, high-level ministerial meeting to focus resource uh, attention on uh, Afghanistan, including uh, attention to the resource gaps uh, that exist. With all of those numbers in mind, um, a few points on uh, FAO's program to date. We've talked about needs at scale. Let me talk about response at scale. FAO already in 2021 has supported nearly 2 million Afghans with urgent livelihoods and cash assistance. In August alone, and remember August has been this very turbulent month as we're all, uh, I think, painfully aware. In August alone, FAO reached 200, more than 200,000 uh, Afghans with um, uh, critical uh, livelihoods and agricultural assistance. FAO is scaling up, but we need more support. The needs have increased, um, even though even before August, we were talking about one in three Afghans in a situation of acute food insecurity. As you would expect, the needs are getting worse. The cost of delivering has increased. And at the same time, uh, access, operational access is actually improving and has improved for uh, FAO in a number of uh, parts of the country. That means we have access to populations that were previously inaccessible, and we absolutely need to take full advantage of that space to deliver. The FAO needs uh, $36 million urgently for this winter season and the coming months. This was uh, a portion of the $606 million that was described in yesterday's uh, event. Those are resources that are going to support wheat packages for this winter season, uh, support concentrate animal feed uh, and vet support for um, uh, herders and uh, livestock uh, owning families, uh, some support for uh, rice horticulture and vegetable growers. Uh, and I should say the cash assistance is a key component for us. The most vulnerable families don't necessarily have access to land. Uh, families in rural areas headed by women, people with disabilities, the elderly, we target as FAO cash assistance. We've been targeting cash assistance to support them, and the 36 million gap that we have is also to respond to that. So in closing, before I come to questions, and I'm keen to, to hear what questions you may have, and I'll certainly do my best to try and answer them, I would just underscore and reiterate uh, just how vital it is that we scale up quickly, we move efficiently. You've heard me describe operations already underway at scale. We have critical windows in time now that we absolutely need to take advantage of. FAO is doing that together with uh, its partners. Uh, drawing attention to the needs, the realities, and the resourcing gaps is indispensable, uh, which is why uh, I'm particularly pleased to have had the opportunity to give a short uh, briefing uh, today. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very, very much for that uh, eye-opening briefing. We'll go to ED Letter Associated Press. Thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this very interesting briefing and sort of very distressing, uh, the numbers. Um, yesterday, there were pledges of $1.2 billion. Is that going to give FAO the $36 million that you need quickly enough to deal with this, these emergencies for ahead of the winter setting in and enabling crops to be planted. And secondly, of the 4 million Afghans in emergency uh, status, how many of them are in rural areas? Do you have any idea? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. 
Thank you very much for those questions. So on the, um, on the first comment regarding uh, funding, so just to say we were uh, encouraged to hear the pledges that uh, were announced yesterday and the resource amounts that were there. As you would expect, FAO is in close uh, discussion, both with the donors who've been funding our significant program um, that supported 2 million people uh, to date. We're talking about uh, uh, priorities now for the coming uh, four months. We hope uh, that we'll be able to fully fund uh, those requirements from these pledges that were uh, announced. Um, many of the pledges, of course, didn't get into details, and I think we need to see exactly what is going to be prioritized. But um, when we see the numbers that are described in the flash appeal, uh, I, I expect and I hope that a significant portion of resources will go to food security, including to FAO. But uh, we'll certainly keep working with donors to, to try and make that, um, make that a uh, reality. The... Um, the population breakdown between rural and uh, 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 urban and rural populations on the IPC side, I don't have the detailed breakdown uh, in my head, but um, uh, just to say that given uh, the uh, seven out of 10 Afghans that live in rural areas, um, when you see uh, and you read uh, the numbers that I was describing, uh, the majority of people in these uh, particularly acute situations, yes, can be found in uh, vulnerable rural areas, those areas where FAO and partners are working. Thank you very much. Michelle Nichols, Reuters. Hi, thank you so much for the briefing. Just wanted to follow up on some of the figures. You said four million are in IPC4. How close are they to famine, um, basically? And what would that mean sort of on the ground? If you could just talk a little bit more about what it means for what we would see on the ground. Thanks. I think there's a, a really important message that uh, FAO stresses in this context and in other contexts, which is it's imperative that we do not wait for a formal documentation of famine before we respond uh, at scale. You heard me mention the numbers. I think you also heard me describe what an IPC4 situation looks like in terms of extreme consumption gaps, uh, high levels of acute uh, malnutrition, uh, and yes, excess mortality also at the IPC4 stage. So it's difficult to speculate how uh, close to IPC5 these populations are. But really the message I want to underscore is when we, when we describe an emergency situation, it is truly an emergency situation that merits a response uh, at scale, the type of response that FAO and partners uh, implement. So we are, we are strongly, uh, th this message about not waiting until famine breaks out to respond at scale, I think is vital to uh, underscore with readers and with the general public. Thank you. And sorry, just another quick follow-up. What's the uh, response been from UN conversations with the Taliban about drought and the food situation in the country? Should I take that question? Yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, so uh, I think all of you are well aware of the um, discussions that um, the emergency relief coordinator undertook recently on behalf of the entire UN system and humanitarian community dialoguing with um, the um, uh, Taliban uh, interim uh, administration uh, talking about uh, both uh, the context and uh, the operating requirements of uh, humanitarian uh, agencies. Um, the, uh, I think there is a, a certainly also from discussions that are taking place in, in different parts of the country and the provinces, there's a keen awareness of just how uh, severe and acute uh, the situation uh, is. Uh, and everything that we've heard from um, uh, technical staff in ministries, from rural communities, from community leaders, uh, is uh, underscoring just how uh, concerned they are about the situation and how welcoming they are of the type of work that FAO does. We're talking about predominantly, I mean, you heard at the beginning some of the percentages I gave, predominantly rural populations with uh, agriculture as a primary livelihood. So this, uh, when this is impacted as it has been by severe drought, uh, this is felt across uh, society in the country. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the screen. Uh, James Reinel from The National. James? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, listen, thanks so much for the briefing. I've got a question um, about opium cultivation. Um, obviously, many Afghan farmers are so broke that they grow the plant that produces heroin instead of food. And of course, you also know that the Taliban have got a track record of making money from drugs. So following the Taliban takeover of the country, how concerned is FAO about this situation getting worse? And are you guys actually keeping tabs on the issue? Rain? So if I may, I, yeah, I mean, go our, our focus at the moment is, thank you. Our focus at the moment, as you would expect, given uh, the situation I've described, is uh, responding to the acute food uh, security needs. Uh, FAO, of course, does work beyond uh, humanitarian uh, response work, including uh, important work around uh, agricultural value chains uh, and uh, supporting um, farmers and communities with uh, high value uh, crops uh, from a sort of uh, an economic development uh, and support uh, perspective. So, I mean, our agency isn't uh, the best place in terms of tracking and monitoring what's happening with uh, the crops you uh, mentioned with uh, opium on a on a national basis. That's not uh, that's not our skill set. But finding viable economic uh, livelihoods uh, is certainly a priority for us as as FAO beyond the beyond the humanitarian response. So it's. Uh, uh, that's a stream of work that is also um, part of uh, FAO's portfolio in the country. Uh, Fethi. Thank you very much, Ahmed Fati, ATN News. Uh, a follow-up on uh, my colleague uh, James Reiner's question about the, the uh, narco economy and, and, and the situation there. Uh, first, uh, uh, it's really admirable, the numbers you've presented in terms of the uh, suggested cost, $150 to feed a family of seven for an entire year, that's uh, truly remarkable. Uh, but with regard to the uh, poppy cultivation, uh, FAO, FAO, FAO is in charge of the agriculture portfolio within the uh, international uh, system, within the UN system. When you are dealing with an emergency, and I'm not going to get to the political side, you are providing regardless of any uh, other consideration. But that would include giving aid to owners of land that's been used to cultivate poppy. And is there within the emergency programs uh, any uh, plans to do a conversion uh, of, of a sort to provide a different cash crop that might be uh, beneficial uh, or of value to, to, to the farmer? Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Ryan. So Let me maybe comment on the. Thank you, Stefan. Let me maybe just comment on the area uh, that's uh, under my particular purview and area of expertise, which is the humanitarian response side. So, I mean, we have, uh, as you would expect, very rigorous, clear targeting uh, criteria um, uh, developed in uh, close discussion with other partners who work on on emergency food security issues and our, our focus in response is always and will always be the most vulnerable uh, the most vulnerable households so that's where we uh, that's where we focus uh, our attention based on need uh, need alone uh, providing the type of support we're providing i'm really uh, unfortunately not in a position to to comment on uh, these more detailed questions on uh, opium as a as a crop, uh, uh, the broader questions on on drug cultivation. It's just not uh, part of my purview and area of expertise. So I hope you'll excuse me from responding to that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibtisam. Uh, thank you, Steve. Hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from the Daily Arabic Al Arab Al Jadid a newspaper. Uh, um, I have a follow-up. You mentioned that women play a lot uh, an important role in agriculture. Could you elaborate in that on that? And also, what about accessibility? Like, are you able to move as you would like? Are you able to get to uh, every area you want to, et cetera? Thank you. Go ahead. So maybe let me start with the access uh, question first. So we, um, as FAO, are implementing activities uh, in uh, 31 of the 34 provinces uh, in the country. And currently, we have uh, active operations in 28 of those 31 provinces. So that gives you a, a sense of, um, you know, the, the scale uh, with which we're able to implement activities uh, currently. Um, uh, our clear sense is that the operating space, and I think I made a comment about this before, 
has improved in many parts of the country as, as active conflict has stopped. And we're certainly doing our very best to uh, take advantage of that space to reach these vulnerable uh, populations I described. So we have uh, uh, essentially a countrywide operation at, at scale, and we're able uh, to access um, uh, significant parts of the country. And of course, our uh, uh, FAO's operating modality is, is working uh, closely with uh, partners and in close consultation with rural uh, communities. And so the, uh, the spread is uh, truly deep field, uh, deep field in that regard. Your first question on the role of um, women in agriculture. So, I mean, there's a detailed response on, you know, what this, uh, what this looks like, but we're uh, clearly, as I mentioned before, focused on vulnerability as a driver for uh, support and attention. And when I, when I made reference to vulnerable rural female headed households as a, as a particular uh, priority uh, for our cash interventions, it's precisely because we are um, always looking to make sure that we are addressing the most acute vulnerabilities in our uh, in our uh, activities. So this uh, has been a priority for FAO, remains a priority for FAO, and, and uh, uh, is something that we're emphasizing in our operations. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back to your screen, uh, Evelyn Leopold. Evelyn, and then we'll go to Dulcie. Evelyn? Go ahead, Evelyn. We can't hear you. Evelyn, we can't hear you. Now. Yes, go Can ahead. You hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Polson. Thank you for the briefing. Uh, quick question. Uh, is Afghanistan still infested uh, with locusts as compared to last year, or has that subsided? Thank you very much. Thank you. My, my understanding uh, is that the locust situation is um, uh, is still a concern. I ran through a few of the drivers of uh, food insecurity at the moment. I didn't mention uh, locusts, but uh, our team has confirmed that it remains a, a challenge, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. Last question to Dulcie yeah. Lembach from Hi. Pass Blue. Uh, hi, thanks very much. I, I just have a question about uh, when you distribute these uh, bags of wheat, et cetera, uh, do, do you have to like pay a tax to the local uh, militia or the Taliban? And uh, where does all this wheat come from? Thanks. Good. So thank you for the question. So the, the wheat, uh, I mean, I mentioned some of the dimensions of the uh, operation. Another strength of the program is that uh, the wheat that we have is all procured inside Afghanistan. This is quality seed uh, that is uh, fully adapted to the agroecological environment in uh, Afghanistan and appropriate for uh, for the terrain. I should say, I mean, I talked about uh, FAO's response. FAO has been active uh, operating in Afghanistan since the early 1980s, and the issue of seed quality uh, is an ongoing part also of FAO's uh, activities. So we're able to procure inside the country. Uh, this is, uh, in other words, uh, local uh, wheat, which uh, I think also helps us from a sort of a, an access perspective. There's no sort of cross-border issues involved there. The other comment I would make is beyond the immediate humanitarian response, this purchasing of locally produced seeds, as you would expect, has all sorts of positive uh, ripple effects on the micro, uh, micro uh, economy. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, on the question of taxation. Yeah. No, go ahead, no, go ahead. I mean, just to say, our, uh, uh, our humanitarian responses, uh, we, uh, we focus on delivering uh, assistance and, uh, you know, protocol is not to, uh, not to pay taxes. The humanitarian assistance should be uh, delivered to the most uh, vulnerable uh, communities, and that's the modality that we certainly strive to support. Thank you. Ryan, thank you so much for uh, joining us from uh, Kabul. We really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we wish you best of luck with the, the mission, and feel free to join us again um, uh, in the next couple of weeks to get an update on, on what FAO has been able to achieve. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.